I remember watching this guy walk through the door as a regular human being, talking to us just like a really nice guy. And the night before, he was a master on stage. He knew how to leave that persona on stage, that hysteria, whatever it is, that magic, and come off stage and just be a person. Elvis Presley is an American icon that ushered in a music revolution that triggered a global cultural transformation. He became known as the king and controversially gave birth to rock and roll in an era of conservatism and conformity. Through his music, Elvis opened the door for black musicians and sparked greater tolerance of open sexuality. Elvis used to talk and he used to say, you know, you ever wonder, Marianne, how you're gonna be remembered? By the time he died in 1977, Elvis had starred in over 30 Hollywood movies and reinvented himself in Las Vegas as a kind of all-American superhero. To this day, Elvis Presley remains one of the most influential figures in American music and culture. I wouldn't want to fashion myself after any one individual because I would like to, I would like to develop my own, uh, my own technique, you know. Elvis Presley lives on. Elvis Aaron Presley was born in a humble family shack in East Tupelo, Mississippi, on January 8, 1935. Sadly, his twin brother Jesse was still born, and his parents Vernon and Gladys were financially challenged and at times relied on welfare just to get by. It was the middle of the Great Depression and East Tupelo was a haven for poor sharecroppers and unskilled factory workers. Elvis's family life was turbulent during these early years, largely due to his family's poverty. From an early age, he was inspired by country music that he heard on the radio and the gospel music that consumed him when attending church each Sunday morning. Whilst attending high school, he developed a passion for rhythm and blues and imaged himself with long, greased-down hair and sideburns. Elvis was regularly teased and harassed by his classmates. His passion for music became all too consuming, his schoolwork faltered, and he became a straight-C student. When aged 18, he recorded a number of demo tracks at Sun's studio and caught the eye of the owner, Sam Phillips. Philip signed Elvis and had him record the song, That's All Right. It was a hit in Memphis and Elvis's first single steadily climbed up the country and western charts. He quickly gained national attention with his forthcoming singles and his sensual performing style raised eyebrows throughout a very conservative United States. His fans, mostly teenage girls, loved and idolised his revolutionary rock and roll music and performances. Elvis learned to play to the girls, teasing them with his body movements and making them scream each time he swivelled his hips. In 1955, Sam Phillips sold Elvis's contract to RCA Records. Moving to RCA was a major step in Elvis's career gaining national and international promotion and distribution. The release of his first album, simply titled Elvis Presley, sold over 360,000 copies in just over a month and became RCA's first million dollar album by a single artist. Elvis Presley also became the first album in music history to sell over a million copies. The following year, Elvis was seeking a bigger and more explosive sound. This resulted in the recording of what would be two of his signature tracks, Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. Hound Dog sold over a half a million copies and climbed to number one on the R&B charts. 
Don't Be Cruel became the biggest two-sided record hit in history. It climbed to number one and held that position for 11 weeks, longer than any other single released in the rock and roll era. His unprecedented sexual performances became a nationwide controversy. The New York Herald Tribune called Alvis unspeakably untalented and vulgar. The criticism prompted parents and religious groups to condemn Alvis and rock and roll music by associating them both with juvenile delinquency. This was a time when even jazz musicians were considered risque. Many people see the world of jazz as one of hysterical teenagers and dope cigarettes. Is this the true picture? Well, as for the dope cigarettes, um, I've never met them. Ordinary ones make me cough quite enough in the morning. And as for the hysterical teenagers, unfortunately, no. Not only was Elvis's image and performances considered repulsive by some, but was considered modern music. What do you think of the modern music? if you can call it that. How, do you feel strongly about it? Well, I like a good deal of it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, it's, I think it's awful hard to generalize about it and say everything is good uh, or bad, uh, but I, I like a good deal of it. What about the, the, the out-and-out rock and roll? Do you like that? Well, I don't call that modern music. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis's performance on The Ed Sullivan Show made television history when the censors decided to shoot the rock and roll star only from the waist up. The media dubbed him Elvis the Pelvis. Never before had an entertainer's hair been the subject of so much attention. Elvis's hairstyle was criticised because of its length and the fact that so many teenagers emulated it. He truly was a trendsetter. In a bid to transform his image to reach an even greater audience, he made his move into Hollywood movies. It was a masterstroke. A phenomenon recalling Marilyn Monroe's sensational debut in show business, Mr. Teenager is on his way to attaining a popularity unparalleled in theater history. But hear this, all ye young at heart, the handsome king of rock and roll will soon be seen in his first picture titled Love Me Tender. It's a cinemascope attraction with Richard Egan and Deborah Padgett that will be released during the Thanksgiving holiday period. And in it, he proves to be as naturally talented as a dramatic actor as he is as a singing entertainer. Audiences enthusiastically received Presley and the films were a great platform to promote his soundtrack albums. Jailhouse Rock may be Elvis's best film because of the way it captured the rebellious rock and roll attitude of the 1950s. The young rebel not only changed the course of popular music, but also gave a generation an identity and an attitude. Jailhouse Rock was the first single ever to enter the British music charts at number one. Elvis was riding the crest of a wave of popularity. Chart-topping records, hit movies, sold-out concerts, fan hysteria and near-constant controversy all helped him to become the biggest star on the planet. But at the pinnacle of his success with the world at his feet, Uncle Sam came calling. Tempo is hut, two, three, four for Private Presley. He's at Camp Chap. The king of rock and roll will be keeping time to non-hip bugle calls. Tired, the gyrating guitarist's departure from the public eye left his blue jean fans all shook up, so we hear. But Elvis doesn't seem to mind at all. The news of Elvis's induction had sparked competition between the armed forces for his services. The Air Force wanted him to tour their recruitment centres and the Navy even offered to create a specially trained Elvis Presley company. But Presley wanted no special treatment and was happy to serve as a regular GI. He was meant to report for his induction into the Army on January 20, 1958, the very same day he was scheduled to start filming King Creole. Paramount contacted the Memphis Draft Board, requesting a deferment until the shooting of the film was complete. The Draft Board had already been deluged by letters from angry fans, 
who saw the conscription as a government attempt to sabotage Elvis's career. President Eisenhower even received letters regarding the Elvis Presley draft situation. In order to ebb the tide of criticism, the draft board agreed to grant Elvis a 60-day deferment. After completing the King Creole film, Elvis reported to the local draft board to begin his service in the United States Army. The enlistment process turned into a media circus. Dozens of reporters and photographers, as well as a film crew, were there to document the historic event. Flashbulbs popped constantly as Elvis went from station to station. He was asked questions, examined and tested. Pronounced fit, Private Elvis Presley, serial number US 53310761, was understandably upset about leaving his distraught mother and father behind. lucrative career as rock and roll king interrupted for a while, Elvis Presley begins his military service at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Just another GI to become acquainted with those interminable army lineups. Uncle Sam doesn't play favorites, and those celebrated sideburns, which were his trademark, are sacrificed to military uniformity. Locks his fans would love to touch, shorn and scattered on the barbershop floor. With the haircut goes $78 a month. He made a cool million last year. Subsequently, issued with his US Army uniform, Private Presley was assigned to the 2nd Armored Division at Fort Hood, Texas, for basic training. Whilst Elvis was in the middle of his training, his mother grew seriously ill. Gladys had not been healthy for some time. She had always wanted the best for Elvis and loved watching his singing and acting career take off. However, as his popularity grew, he was home less and less, and Gladys sank into a deep depression. To deal with her loneliness and fears, Gladys drank heavily while Elvis was away. Sadly, Gladys' love Smith Presley died of a heart attack when she was only 46 years old. But Elvis had to soldier on. After completing his training, he and the 1,400 other members of his company boarded a train to New York, where they were to have a brief layover before being shipped off to West Germany. Pulling into Brooklyn was a very important person, none other than Elvis Presley, Private Presley, soldier nowadays in Uncle Sam's service. The one of the fans and an army of pressmen were on hand. This was indeed an occasion. The rock and roll king was about to embark for foreign service, 18 months in Germany. How the army would stand the impact of Mr. Presley was a big question months ago, but not now, as Elvis explains. Elvis, uh, uh, since you've been in the army, have the boys given you kind of a rough time in the barracks because of your past career, would you say? No, sir, I was very surprised. Uh, I I've never met a, a, a better group of boys in my life. They, uh, they probably would have uh, if it had been like everybody thought. I mean, everybody thought I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't have to work, and I would uh, be given special treatment and this and that. But when they looked around and saw I was, I was on KP and I was pulling guard and everything just like they were, well, they figured, well, it's just like us. The conservative pressmen took their last opportunity to quiz the king of rock and roll about his music and its possible demise. Well, sir, rock and roll has been around for many years. Uh, it, it used to be called rhythm and blues. And uh, as far back as I can remember, it's, it's been very big, although in the last five years it's gotten much bigger. But I personally don't think it will ever die completely out, it, uh, uh, because they're going to have to get something mighty good to take its place as far as the young people are concerned. What about, what about cleaning it up or, or at least uh, improving it morally and maybe taking the uh, wiggle out of it? Well, sir, you take the wiggle out of it, it's finished. <laughs> Have you had any <laughs> incidents? Well, why, is that, why is that? Well, rock and roll music, if you like it, and if you feel it, you can't help but move to it. That's what happens to me. I, I, uh, I can't help it. I mean, I have to move around. I, I can't stand still. I've, I've tried it, and I, I can't do it. Elvis was then asked to answer his many critics that claimed that he was a bad influence on his young fans. Yes, sir, I have. I, I don't... I don't see, 
I tried to figure out, I don't see how they could think that it would contribute to juvenile delinquency, someone suddenly singing and dancing. I, I, don't, I don't see that, because if there's anything I've tried to do, I've tried to live a straight, clean life and uh, not set any kind of a bad example. Well, Elvis, but I will say this, yeah. excuse me, sir. I, I will say that uh, there are people that are going to like you and people that don't like you, regardless of what, what business you're in or what you do. Uh, you cannot please everyone. Elvis then shipped out of the Brooklyn Navy Yards aboard the USS General Randall, bound for Bremerhaven, West Germany. On the eve of the departure, Elvis was promoted to private first class. Unbeknownst to Presley, he was nearly as popular in West Germany as in the United States. Nearly 2,000 screaming German fans greeted him when he docked in Bremerhaven. Uh, I was very surprised at, at the reception. Uh, I wasn't expecting anything that quite that, that big. And I only regret that I didn't have more time to stay there with them. But uh, maybe someday I can come back when my army tour is up as an entertainer, and then I'll have more time and maybe I'll have an opportunity to uh, kind of make myself at home over here. Arrivederci. Well, that's Italian. <laughs> Elvis was assigned duty as a Jeep driver, the perfect assignment for a man who loved cars as much as he did. He was rewarded for his diligence by being promoted to corporal. Despite the public hype surrounding him, Elvis behaved just like any other soldier. He carried a gun and he pulled KP, and even did guard duty, which was not a wise assignment. Because Elvis was so famous in Europe, whenever he was exposed to the public, they appeared in droves. One night, a huge crowd gathered when Elvis was doing guard duty at a military entrance. He was standing as ordered, but was surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of fans. It practically took a platoon to rescue him. Elvis's army, MOS, was as a tank gunner, which seemed to be a more appropriate assignment. Elvis loved guns, and these were big ones. But there was a problem. Because the guns were so loud, he began suffering from ringing ears, and at times seemed to be deaf. Eventually, Elvis was taken out of the tanks. Elvis was permitted to live off base with his family during his tour in Germany. He rented a modest house where he lived with his father and grandmother. Regularly, he'd invite fellow soldiers over for jam sessions. One of Elvis's army buddies invited a young girl named Priscilla Bailu. It was love at first sight when Elvis met the girl that would one day be his wife. For Priscilla, dating Elvis Presley was a dream come true. But the romance came to an abrupt end only a few months after it began. Elvis's tour of duty was over. In the press, she became known as the girl he left behind. When questioned at a press conference back in the States, Elvis denied that any type of romance was going on between him and Priscilla. Well before he came home, America had already begun preparing for the return of Elvis Presley. Even though he had spent two years without making a record or a public appearance, Elvis still ruled the record charts. I understand that you want to uh, become a dramatic actor, is that right? Well, so that, that's, uh, that's my big ambition now. It takes a lot of time, a lot of experience, but uh, I, uh, I hope I'll make it. I mean, that, that, that's what I want to do. And do you feel that you want to fashion yourself after Sinatra or perhaps uh, James Dean? Uh, I, I wouldn't want to fashion myself after any one individual because I would like to, I would like to develop my own, uh, my own technique. You know. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, I admire you know Mr. Sinatra. I think he's a great actor and all that. But. Uh, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to pattern myself after any individual. All this means, of course, that some of your music uh, will lose, perhaps. You'll be doing fewer records? No, sir, it doesn't mean that, because uh, uh, I wouldn't want to give up singing. I, I'm, I'm only saying that I, I would like to, uh, to become a good actor. You know. <laughs> 
He was coming home to the United States as an even bigger star than when he had left. When Elvis returned to the public spotlight in 1960, it was obvious that he had matured both physically and professionally. As time would tell, Elvis was a changed man when he emerged from the army. He surprised everyone by trading in the frenzied trappings of his rock and roll youth for a more mature image built on the good publicity from his tour of duty. Elvis, do you plan to make a picture about your experiences in the army or about the army at all? Well, my first picture is called uh, G.I. Blue, oddly enough. And uh, the story takes place in Germany, but it, it's not about my actual experiences. The success of his forthcoming movies and pop music albums were testament to the wide appeal of this new, more mellow-styled Elvis. Elvis was honourably discharged from active duty on March 5, 1960. He received his mustering out cheque of 109 US dollars and he could now return to the life and career he had left behind. Presley had now won the hearts and minds of his mainstream press and general public. When Elvis released his biggest hit ever, It's Now or Never, he received airplay on conservative radio stations that previously didn't play his records, thus exposing him to a wider adult audience. Elvis wasn't the only Presley to find a new love in Germany. His father, Vernon, met Dee Stanley whilst living there. Dee returned to America with Vernon after Elvis's discharge, and the two were married in Alabama. Elvis did not attend his father's wedding, which led to speculation that the marriage caused friction between the two men. Elvis not only gained a stepmother, but he got three stepbrothers as well. Billy, Rick and David grew very close to Elvis. Elvis wasn't only their big brother, he also became their role model and protector. When I was a kid in school, uh, I didn't get along with people too well. Everybody I thought was trying to use me. I mean, everybody was trying to get to me because of Elvis. As a result, I didn't have a real good attitude about high school. Elvis saw this rebellious streak in my life, and he said, hey, David, forget school. Go to work for me. Drop out of school, go to work for me, and, and I'll take care of you. Elvis's first television performance after his discharge was on the Frank Sinatra Timex special, Welcome Home, Elvis. The program received phenomenal ratings, gaining a 41.5 share for that evening. Elvis was paid a staggering 125,000 US dollars for a total of six minutes on the air. But this would be his last television performance for eight years. When Elvis's fans wanted to see him now, they would have to go to the movies. In May 1960, Elvis returned to Hollywood to begin shooting GI Blues. The film was enormously successful and the soundtrack album reached number one quickly, remaining on the charts longer than any other Elvis Presley album. Movie critics approved of his new image and predicted he would find plenty of new fans amongst older women. Elvis didn't share the critics' enthusiasm for GI Blues. He felt that there were too many musical numbers and believed some of them made no sense within the context of the plot. He was also concerned that the quality of many of these songs were not as good as the music in his earlier films. His manager pushed Presley into a heavy movie-making schedule, focusing mostly on low-budgeted musical comedies. Elvis at first insisted on pursuing more serious roles, but his attempts to be a dramatic actor in The Flaming Star and Wild in the Country both flopped at the box office. He then reverted to the low-budget soundtrack formula. The 27 films he made during the 1960s were mostly canned by critics, but were consistently successful at the box office. Seven years after Alvis first met Priscilla, he proposed. The wedding ceremony took place at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas and took less than 10 minutes. Two months later, it was announced that Priscilla was pregnant, but after the arrival of their daughter, Lisa Marie, the relationship broke down. Some years later, they held hands during their divorce proceedings and remained friends. Recently, Priscilla reflected on her time with the man she held so dear. To me, the times I cherished were the times that we were alone. And, you know, there was always so many people in, in the entourage at all times. And uh, we lived and breathed together with the entourage, traveled together, ate together, and experienced a lot of things, but the times that we were alone and when he really revealed himself. 
During his time in Hollywood, it was often rumoured that Alvis dated his co-stars, something that Marianne Mobley strongly denies. You know, we never dated. We did two movies together. We were great friends and we never dated. In fact, I never saw him off the MGM lot, which was my home studio, uh, except on two occasions. And once he and the boys were taking me home because my, har, my car, my car, my car was uh, in the shop. And then uh, once when he invited my husband and I to come to Vegas for one of his concerts. But always, uh, one of the boys would call and say, uh, Marianne, we got a new number at the house and Elvis wanted you to have it in case you ever needed us. He was a very loyal and loving friend. In the late 60s, Elvis's career began to falter due to a string of mediocre movies and soundtracks. After he decided to stop making movies in the late 1960s, Elvis returned to his first love, music, and recorded How Great Thou Art. The recording proved to be a milestone in Elvis's career, winning him his first Grammy Award. After Elvis felt the excitement of singing for a live audience during the performance in his TV comeback special, he was keen to return to the concert stage. He was invited to play at the new International Hotel in Las Vegas. He was terribly nervous about performing in front of a live audience in Las Vegas, but despite his nerves, his performance was an enormous success. The hotel offered Elvis a five-year contract to play two months a year at a salary of one million US dollars per year. 69, he opens in Vegas, the family's there, I'm 14. He starts touring in 1970. Now I'm a Beatles, Stone, I'm a rock and roller. And here's my big brother, the king of rock and roll. And I began to realize that when I saw those shows, started touring with him and watching others respond to him, not necessarily just an audience of fans, but other rock and rollers who would meet him and just, wow, this is, this is the king. Elvis comes back and walks into our dressing room. He sent us flowers, good luck, good wishes and everything. And he really talked like this too, you know, how you all doing? And uh, I remember watching this guy walk through the door as a regular human being, talking to us just like a really nice guy. And the night before, he was a master on stage. At least to me, my perception, the guy knew how to shut it off. He knew how to leave that persona on stage, that hysteria, whatever it is, that magic, and come off stage and just be a person. After his successful engagements in Las Vegas, Elvis took his act on the road and toured intensively for the next few years. By 1971, Elvis was on the road more than most other acts in show business. He would tour for three weeks at a time, taking no days off and doing two shows on Saturdays and Sundays. Elvis and his entourage would arrive in a city and depart again in less than 24 hours. Such a demanding schedule took its toll in terms of Elvis's desire to update or change the material in his act. Eventually, his performances became standardized, even routine. Despite this, Elvis' concerts were almost always sold out. His dependency on a variety of prescription drugs and the non-stop touring started to take its toll on Elvis Presley's physical and mental health. In 73, 74, 75, we were having some great years. Elvis was involved in prescribed medication. That went from use to abuse. Uh, for example, Elvis was like 165, 168, 72, 73, up until 74. 75, about 200, 76, 77, 255. These were results of medications prescribed by doctors uh, that Elvis took on a regular basis. This went from a use to abuse scenario. Hugely overweight, and his mind significantly dulled by the drugs that he took daily, he was barely able to pull himself through his abbreviated concerts. When on stage, he was so nervous he could hardly talk. Elvis's overuse of drugs evolved into a frightening level of abuse, and he was hospitalized several times. Personally downhearted and paranoid, Elvis grew bored and dissatisfied. By 1976, it was almost impossible to get Elvis into a recording studio, despite his contractual obligations. Sadly, Elvis Presley died on August 16, 1977, in the bathroom of his Graceland mansion in Memphis, Tennessee. 
He was just 42 years old. Alvis had been on the toilet, but fallen off onto the floor, where he lay in a pool of his own vomit. Uh, Joe Esposito, Charlie Hodge, Vernon Presley, Sandy Miller, a couple of others were there, and they had converged on him, and they had just rolled him over, and I realized that he was gone. Uh, there was no mistake uh, that on that day, Elvis Presley had left the building. The paramedics said, uh, what do we have? They came, they started working. I automatically blurted out, it's a drug overdose. Now, that's a controversial issue with a lot of people, uh, but it's funny how the world's tried to become an authority on my big brother. I was there. I lived with this guy for 17 years. I toured with him for five years. I knew his habits, medications, wins, wears, do's, don'ts. That day, he took too much, and it cost him his life. The news of Elvis's death not only stopped a nation, it shocked the whole world. Within an hour after Elvis's death, fans began to gather in front of Graceland. By the following day, when the gates were open for mourners to view Elvis's body, the crowd was estimated to be 20,000 and grew to a staggering 80,000 mourners at the close of the day. Much like the day that President Kennedy was assassinated, everyone remembers where and what they were doing when they first heard the news, Elvis is dead. President Jimmy Carter issued a statement that credited Presley with having permanently changed the face of American popular culture. Eventually, so many mourners arrived that it was impossible for them all to be admitted to Graceland. Law enforcement officials were there in force concerned that the crowd might get out of hand. But fortunately, although the gathering was at times hysterical, it remained peaceful. The stifling Memphis heat and the emotions felt on that day took its toll on some. The official coroner's report states cardiac arrhythmia as the cause of Presley's death, but later it was admitted that his death was caused by a cocktail of 10 prescribed drugs taken in doses no doctor would ever prescribe. I think people always sensed in Elvis, in Elvis the sense of uh, kindness and, and love that he had. I mean, he was also fun, but uh, he was much uh, nicer than I think most people even realize, those who loved him. He was just innately a good person. The one thing about Elvis was that uh, he didn't really understand what made him great. I think that there was a time when he questioned it and he wondered, what am I doing? What do I have? What is this? And then I think later he just accepted it. Elvis Presley's funeral was held at Graceland. Approximately 80,000 people lined the processional route to Forest Hill Cemetery, where Presley was buried next to his mother. Following an attempt to steal his body, he was reburied in Graceland's Meditation Garden. The following year, thousands returned to Memphis to commemorate the first anniversary of Elvis Presley's death. A hundred thousand fans are here from all over the world. Almost every one of them will spend most of one day queuing to see Presley's grave. Pilgrimages to the Graceland Mansion have continued to this day to commemorate the anniversary of his death. People from all around the world come together to take part in the emotional experience and participate in candlelight vigils. Although Alvis didn't perform in Europe, many make the trip across the Atlantic to pay homage to their king. Possibly because I think we missed out. Oh, excuse me, because I'm going to get emotional. Because he never came. <laughs> We wanted him to come so much, he didn't, so, so this is the best we can get. קודם כל, כמות מטורפת של כריזמה. האיש הזה, from his, מפה עד his toes, הוא 100% כריזמה מפוצלת. אנחנו שאלנו כל מיני אנשים, אם אלוויס היה חי היום והיה רץ לנשיא ארצות הברית, אנחנו בוחרים בו far out מכל אחד, כל קנדידט שעומד מולו היה הולך הביתה. The fans willing to make the journey to Memphis are not only Europeans, he truly touched the hearts of people in all corners of the world. I don't see Elvis as an, an American idol. 
you know, I think he is international because uh, many people in my country, they don't speak English, but they love the song. I don't know why they don't understand the lyrics, but they love the songs. It's, I think it's his voice and his feelings, you know, he, he was a soul singer. I think that's why. And we are all having a blast here. It means so much to us to be here. Um, to me personally, my dream come true is to play a small part in carrying on Elvis's legacy of love. We, we love him so much. And this is my first time being here. And it just means so much to me. Well, I come from Australia and I've been coming twice a year since 94. And just for the love of Elvis and the friendships we make here too. It's, it's, it's like a big family. And it's lovely coming back here to them all. It's very sort of safe and peaceful and it's just near the graveside. It's really another world. It's, uh, mm, I just love the feeling up there, yeah. And it's just amazing, all the people out here and the devotion they have to him and all the candles lit and just, it's, it's just fabulous, it's fabulous. Everybody needs to do it once. <laughs> Priscilla Presley made an appearance as part of an event marking the 30th anniversary of Elvis Presley's death. During a sold out session, she spoke of her love of his music. Every song he sang, he put his heart and soul into it. And it's hard to have a favorite song because just when you say, oh, this is my favorite, then you hear another song and you go, oh God, this is my favorite. And then you hear that song and you go, oh, that song brings back memories. I really like that song. You know, I don't know, I, when you grow up or you grew up listening to Elvis songs, there's a really a special meaning to all of them. It's been going on for 30 years. It doesn't look like it's ever going to stop. Uh, I don't know why. I think Elvis just was one of those magical dudes, man. I mean, he, he was a highly spiritual individual. He uh, had a tremendous charisma and a magnetism about him that goes beyond uh, explanation. I mean, if Elvis Presley walked into this building today, I would feel the presence of him. I mean, that's how strong his presence was. And uh, that's an unexplainable phenomenon that I think in 30 years from now, uh, I'll be 80 something years old and we may be still sitting in this room talking about why is Elvis Presley so big. The 30th anniversary saw not only loved ones and family members reflect on Elvis's life, but also Mary Ann Mobley, who gave a personal insight into what Elvis thought about his own legacy. I do think that Elvis would have been surprised. Elvis used to talk and he used to say, you know, you ever wonder, Mary Ann, how you're gonna be remembered? And I think he would be very surprised, pleasantly so, to know that uh, 30 years later that about 50,000 people will be coming to Graceland on the anniversary of his death. Elvis has made a lasting impression on some of the most unlikely of fans. A former Japanese Prime Minister is a self-confessed Elvis maniac. He was terribly excited when he took a tour of Presley's Graceland home with President George W. Bush. The visit here is uh, an indication of uh, how well known Elvis was around the world. There's a lot of people still singing Elvis Presley songs here in the States, and there's a lot of people who loved Elvis Presley in Japan, including the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, who actually shares his birthday with Elvis, demonstrated his vocal talents. I thought you were going to do blue suede shoes. <laughs> Elvis's daughter Lisa Marie and Priscilla clearly enjoyed the antics of Kozumi during their private tour. Lisa Marie has been actively keeping the Presley music tradition going. In 2003, she released her first solo album titled To Whom It May Concern. The album received positive feedback from her peers in the industry. <laughs> Bob Teddy called me out of nowhere one day and was like, saw the video and was saying, uh, just from one artist to another, I think it's amazing and you know, you have your own thing going on and it's great. Who else? I don't know. A few others. Elton John sent me flowers, um, which I was very happy about. That was very sweet, saying he liked the record. 
Riley Keogh, Elvis's granddaughter, has also kept the show business tradition alive in the family. When aged just 14, she made her catwalk debut for Dolce & Gabbana at two fashion shows in Milan. Before, it was really scary and I was shaking. But then when you get out, it's really fun and I like doing it. Despite her nerves, she impressed two of the biggest names in the fashion world. Era tranquillo, era per DNG, era nervosa perché era la prima volta. Poi ha fatto la prima, la prima uscita, fatto. Riley's mother, Lisa Marie, made history when she married another musical king, the king of pop, the late Michael Jackson. It's been said that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. That being the case, Elvis is truly an admired entertainer. All around the world, fans participate in Elvis Presley impersonator competitions. Israeli Elvis impersonators regularly gather at a petrol station known as the Elvis Inn near Jerusalem. The crowd uh, in Israel love, love his song. There's a, there's a lot of they have a lot of uh, styles, you know, the rhythm of blues and the gospel, and I think his grand-grandmother was a tourist. Well, that's why I heard. Few celebrate Elvis quite like the Japanese. Young and old, male or female. Like the Japanese passion for karaoke, it seems everyone likes to take center stage when wearing an Elvis costume. Some even see him as a godlike figure. The Elvis craze has even hit the shores of Goa in India. And it's good for business entertaining locals and tourists alike. The response is very good, very good. I don't have a place to sit. People are shouting at me. I don't know how to cope with it. Wish me luck. This is the most greatest thing that ever happened to me. Filipino Walter Perez is just one of many diehard Elvis fans that put it all on the line in the hope of winning a trip to Graceland. As to whether he likes it or not, he is the king of rock and roll, he is the king of ballad, he is the king of the music, he is a soldier. Walter Perez! Kuala Lumpur played host to the Malaysian leg of the same competition and enlisted a professional Elvis impersonator as chief judge of the auditions. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed with the uh, way uh, the impersonators have actually come up with their own version of Elvis. You see, as you can see, everybody um, um, remembers Elvis in different way, and today they've come to show it their way. Fifty Elvis Presley lookalikes took to the streets of central London to celebrate what they believe to be the 50th anniversary of the birth of rock and roll. This is the 50th anniversary of Elvis' first song. But it's not just the 50th anniversary of Elvis' first song, it's the 50th anniversary of rock and roll. The defining moment in history is when Elvis went into that recording studio in Sun and sang That's All Right. For me, for Elvis, it's the, the uh, crossover appeal, the fact that he can cross over to all races and colour, which is, which is um, to have that kind of talent is extraordinary as well. It seems Elvis's riding around in a double-decker bus was not quite eye-catching enough for the English. On what would have been Elvis's 70th birthday, 77 Elvis impersonators crammed into a department store in an attempt to enter the Guinness Book of Records. I'm going to give it a count of four. After a count of four, the guitar intro, and then into the song. Well, today they've set a Guinness World Record for having the most Elvis impersonators singing in one location. As you can hear behind me, they had a 77 Elvises all fully dressed with their wigs and their glasses and their singing voices, and it was great. 
The ongoing Elvis phenomenon is largely due to his following of loyal fans. Today, his influence is still felt by performers from all generations. He was definitely a pioneer of, of trying to do a little bit of everything, of being a triple threat, um, acting and singing and dancing and just being a full-fledged entertainer. So um, I guess I'm trying to follow in his footsteps in a way. Hound Dog was one of the first records I had. It was a tiny little, little 45. <laughs> and it was Hound Dog, and I used to listen to it all the time, all the time. So yeah, Elvis, a big part of my, my musical education. Yeah, I think he just had amazing charisma, really, um, and uh, a great performance, and, uh, and you know, people uh, recognize that and could feel um, his passion in what he did. But obviously you can't, you know, escape um, his, uh, his image, uh, his persona, um, what he's done for the, the you know, music as a whole. Uh, I, um, but there are songs that are, that are inescapable of his that are fantastic songs. I think, you know, we've, uh, we'll learn from each other uh, along the way, don't we, from, uh, from him, but uh, hundreds of others along the way will take our, our little bit and, uh, and learn from what's gone on in the past. The king of rock and roll had humble roots in the American South, but from them went on to embody the American dream, becoming nothing less than the most popular entertainer the world has ever seen. He gave the world a revolutionary musical style. He broke down barriers and continues to inspire millions to this day. John Lennon once said, before Elvis, there was nothing. The legacy of Elvis Presley lives on.